Well, good morning. It is really good to, to see all of you here again. I, uh, I just want to start off by just sharing something a little ironic, which is that this came in the mail on Friday. Um, really an official document. I mean, it's pretty cool. And it was dressed, addressed to Leona, and so it, it brought tears to my eyes as I, when I get those kinds of letters and things. Um, it says, prepared for Leona Brower, life insurance proposal. It's from a company we've done business with for 50 years, AAA. Um, she's no longer on the policy, but they sent this to me on behalf of her. And, and so I, I opened it up, and, and um, it says here, guaranteed coverage. And, and, and I'm like, well, really? And then, it, and then it says in here, I'm not making this up, no medical exams, lab tests, or health questions. I'm thinking of applying. And I realized, you know what? She had the best life insurance policy you can have. And she cashed in on it. And if you believe in Jesus as your Savior, you can't get a better life insurance policy than that. One day we're all going to cash in on that too. Grace, mercy, and peace to you. May God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I want to um, do something that's a little bit out of the ordinary from how I how I preach here, but I'm going to start off with the verse, just one verse. And by the end of today, you're going to have it memorized. Okay, something you can hold near and dear. You're going to meditate on it. Second Corinthians five. Verse 21, and here's how it goes. It's on the screens. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, I want to tell you right now that, in my opinion, this is one of the most incredible statements in all of the Bible. It's like the gospel in a nutshell, the gospel in just one simple verse. Everything you want to know about how to get to heaven, about how to guarantee your life insurance, about how to guarantee your salvation to live with God for all eternity. And one of the things that I love about this verse is is this verse has in it a, a great dichotomy. It is so simple, and yet it's so profound. So here's how simple it is. There's just 23 words in this verse, and 21 of those 23 words only have one syllable. One of those 23 words has two, and one of those 23 words has three, righteousness, right? That's how simple it is. Here's how profound this verse is. Books have been written about this one verse. Books have been written about what these 23 words mean for you and and for me. This one verse in this one chapter of this book, the Bible, which has 66 books, 1,200 chapters, 31,000 verses, 807,000 words. I didn't count the syllables, but I probably had the time to do that. But this one verse of just 23 words is so important. You miss, if you miss the verse, you miss the important truth that you need to know about God, about Jesus, and about the meaning of of the cross. And you can be wrong about a lot of things in, in, in church doctrine. You can be off in your interpretation about a lot of things when it comes to reading the Bible and trying to understand what it means about this or that and still be saved. But you miss this and what this verse means, you're in trouble. Do I have your attention? This one verse means everything. And here's my point. We live in a time and a, and a place, as, as we all are well aware, that there's a lot of confusion out there in the world. And it doesn't help that a lot of Christian churches add to that confusion, especially when they come up with new interpretations about what God has to say in his word because they're trying to get God's word to conform to how somebody wants to live their lifestyle. And that's just, that's just a fact. So it just gets even, even more and more confusing. I mean, we are confused about what is right and what is wrong and what is moral And what is not, what battles we're supposed to pick, what battles we're supposed to just let go, what kinds of uh, of things we can do, what's pleasing to God, what gives God heartburn. We're just confused about everything. 
And the result of all this confusion is distraction. And when we as Christians have distraction, we get distracted from the number one priority that God has for his church. That's us on this earth, no matter what, no matter where, no matter with whom. Love God and love people. Period. That's it. That's our number one job. Our number one job is to love them and then to share the message of Jesus Christ as the way to salvation. If you're still, you've heard me say this before, if you still are believing and breathing on this earth, that's your job. And that's mine. That's the job of a disciple of Jesus Christ. To point to him as the savior of the world. How? By sharing with them the gospel. Which begs the question then, I think it makes sense that we know exactly what the gospel is, don't you think? So, to know what the gospel is, it means that we have to know what the cross that Jesus died on is really all about. So the title of the series that we're in week two of is called Cross Perspectives. And this sermon series is, is meant to, to help us gain a better understanding of what the cross means. So we're looking at it from five different perspectives. The point of views, perspectives of God. What does the cross mean to God? As we heard last week from Pastor Stephen. What does a cross mean to Jesus? That's what we're going to be talking about today. What does a cross mean to Satan? What does the cross mean to the world? And what does the cross mean to the church? To us. As part of Christ's church. Cross perspectives. There was a movie slogan a number of years ago. Boy, it might have been almost 20 years ago now. And that slogan was, See it again for the very first time. Does anybody remember it was for a movie slogan? Anybody remember what that was for? If you think you know what that was for, shout it out. See it again for the very first time. It's related to Star Wars. Yeah. Anybody go see it? Anybody go see it? I didn't want to. My kid did, so I did. I went and saw it. I saw all three of, of, of the re-releases. And I got to tell you, I really appreciated the slogan because with all the edits that were brought back in and all the new visual technology, it was like seeing it again for the very first time. And the reason I bring that up because that's the hope that, that I have for all of us as we discuss the perspectives that we have of the cross and that others have of the cross. Um, as we discuss probably the most recognizable symbol in all of the world, the cross of Jesus Christ, that we See the cross of Jesus again and again and again for the very first time. So, back to this one verse, these 23 words, our text for today. Each phrase in this verse, there are three of them we're going to focus on today. They each tell us what the cross meant to Jesus. And each of those phrases also tells of a miracle that we cannot explain, but we accept it. We accept the miracle for what it is through the gift of faith that we have. Here's the first phrase. It says, God made him who had no sin. So I just break this down to four words. He had no sin. All right? That's the, that's the first phrase. He had no sin. This is the first miracle in the, the text, this one verse. Born without sin, without original sin. That's why his daddy was God. All right? No original sin. And he never committed a sin. Now, some translations say Jesus knew no sin, and I, that's not as accurate a translation, uh, literally, of the Greek. But um, I, I believe that some people translate it that way because they really want to emphasize that he didn't even have sin from inside, from his mind. It just wasn't there in him. However, I want to break this down just to give us a perspective of what it means. Jesus, first of all, had no outward sin. Wrap your mind around that. No one ever could see him sin because he didn't sin. He never had disrespect for his parents. How many of you can say that that's true for you? No disrespect for his teachers, for his bosses, for anybody in authority in the church. Ever. He never gossiped. Raise your hand if you never gossiped. He didn't lie. He didn't cheat. 
He didn't steal. He didn't even borrow anything and not give it back because that's stealing too. And he never cheated on his taxes. I thought I'd throw in something very relevant for today. All right? He didn't do that. And, and, and it, 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 not only did he not commit any outward sins, but he didn't have any sin from inside either. Now think what that means. That, that no bad thoughts, no jealousy, no envy, no lust. I remember being taught that from the time we were this high, right, Pam? I mean, Jesus was without sin. So follow in his steps. Okay, Dad. <laughs> we'll do our best. But every time I think about it, and I think the older I get and the more that I'm in this world, the more amazing it is to me that, that, that Jesus could remain sinless because Jesus was in the world. He was dealing with sinners all the time. That was his mission. That's who he went after. The people who weren't there yet into the kingdom. He wanted them there. So he went with them. He ate with them. He helped them. He healed them. And yet the sin of the world, it never tarnished him. It never tainted him. It never tainted his, his character. C can you imagine how much he must have been bullied as a kid in school? I mean, isn't that who gets bullied? Those who are who are better than, they don't want to stoop down to the, to the lack of morals of the bully. And so they get bullied. Maybe that's why not much is recorded of his childhood. What would you name the book? Huh? The kid everyone hated. Right? The goody two-shoes. Stay away from them. They're just going to judge you. What that must have meant. I remember uh, Max Licato in his book, one of his questions he asked of Mary, the 25 questions I'd like to ask Mary is, and the one is I like is, did he ever come home with a black eye? Yeah. I don't know. That doesn't mean he wasn't tempted to sin, though. And I think that's a, a very important contrast to make. He was tempted all the time. And he'd face those temptations head on. I mean, look what Satan did in the, in the, in the desert for 40 days. He tempted him with everything that he had. He never gave up tempting Jesus. And yet, Jesus never gave up using the word of God to thwart the temptations. You know, there's a phrase that we use a lot. And I was just talking about this, Kevin, just the other night. We were talking about how a lot of times we say God gives us, never gives us more than we can handle. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Where that context is, it, it, it says that he never gives us more than we can handle when it comes to temptation. He always gives us a door out. He always gives us a way out from that. And then he also gives us the power to say no. Jesus was always using that power because it was the word of God. And so though he was tempted, he never, ever sinned. Can you even imagine that? He, he never felt any guilt for sins because he didn't have any sins to feel guilty for. He never confessed his sins. He wouldn't have to come here until after confession. Because he didn't have any sins to confess. He was sinless. He was perfect. Jesus met the bar of holiness that God set and said, all right, I am holy and you cannot be in my presence or I will destroy you unless you're holy too. So here's the bar. Here's the Ten Commandments. Oh, shoot, you can't keep them. Okay, I'm going to come down there and keep them for you. As Jesus. The bar of holiness. Jesus, sinless, perfect. So what did the cross mean to Jesus? Knowing he had no sin, all right? This is critical to the character and purpose of Jesus, which is why the movie many years ago, The Last Temptation of Christ, that gave Christians heartburn like crazy, right? How many of you saw that movie? I thought it was a pretty good movie. Cinematography and stuff like that, I thought it was pretty good, but I was wondering where it was going, you know? But the problem is the premise of that, of that film was that Jesus wasn't perfect, that he had sin. The problem is that if that were the case, if Jesus had sinned even a little bit, whatever the sin, one little thought, one misspoken word, one harmless gossip, as if gossip is harmless, he couldn't be our savior. Because... The sacrifice to appease sin, as Pastor Stephen talked about last week, was perfection. He had to be holy 
That was, that was what was required, a perfect sacrifice. And that's why foreshadowing that perfect sacrifice in the humanness of Jesus was in the priest in the Old Testament using sacrificial lambs that were without what? Spots and blemishes, all right? That was the sign of, okay, this is as perfect as we can get, all right? And so this is what we're going to sacrifice. And then the, 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 the priest would do that, had to be without that. Jesus became the sacrificial lamb for our sins. Okay, you know his cousin John, right? Cousin John out in the wilderness eating grasshoppers and honey and all that kind of stuff. And I know people, I can't believe anybody would even listen to him, probably how he looked and how he came in, but he was a powerful speaker. He was a prophet of God, right? And, and when his cousin Jesus shows up on the scene, he points to him, right? And he says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Do you think they understood? Absolutely they did. He spoke their language. He was saying, that's the Messiah we've been waiting for 2,000 years. That is the Savior of the world. And because Jesus knew, knew that, because he's both fully God and fully human, and, and he knew that, that he alone could be that perfect sacrifice and defeat Satan and his grip on you and me. By going to that cross, the most painful and shameful way to die. You know, I think it's important that we look at two sides of Jesus here, the, the two natures of Jesus, because I think that, that confuses us a lot, just like the Trinity does. Well, Jesus himself had, had two natures. He was fully God and fully human. So in his human nature, he didn't want to go to the cross. I probably read this verse in, 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 in Luke chapter 22 once a week at least because I'm, I think the hardest thing to accept and just to accept is the humanness of Jesus. Sometimes we, we put Jesus out there transcendently saying, oh, he's just, he's, he's God, you know, so but he was human. He, he felt what we feel. He had emotions. He felt pain. And in that scripture reading in Luke 22, he was in the garden. This description in the garden, the doctor Luke talked about him weeping so intensely, praying so intensely that he wept like tears of blood. Hematosis, I think that's the word for it. It's a, it's a, it's a medical condition. It can't happen because of great stress. He did not want to go there. And, but he, say, he said, remove this cup from me, Father, if it's your will, not mine, because we knew what his was. You know, sometimes I wonder why I struggle so much when I, I pray to God earnestly, f fervently, and, and then he does the opposite. <laughs> and why I can't accept that? Jesus did it. <laughs> My goodness. He had to go through all that. So why'd he go? Because he was also God in the flesh. And he knew he had a job to do. He didn't want to go. But he knew what going to that cross was going to accomplish for you and me. And that is what is important. There's a verse in Hebrews 12, verse 2 which I, I think sometimes gets a little confusing, but when you put it in context, it says, for the joy set before him, meaning Jesus, for the joy set before Jesus, he endured the cross. He endured it because he knew. He knew the forgiveness and salvation it was going to bring to the people he loved, the world. So that's the first phrase in this text he had no sin then the second one really throws you he became sin so he became sin for us here's the second miracle in our text he becomes sin how's that possible i have no clue i i, I have no clue i just know it doesn't mean he became a sinner it just means he became sin and and the whole wrath of god destroyed that sin there's a couple historical um, ideas about this. Christians have used two phrases um, to describe what this means, that he became sin. The first one is that he took our place. 
And the second one is that he took our penalty. All right? So, again, you talked about this last week. You know, it's kind of interesting that some of what we're talking about with these two weeks especially are so similar, but, of course, we're talking about God both times, right? So, anyway, so he took our place. We call that the doctrine of substitution. He was our substitute. Those nails that were pounded into, into his hands, wrists, feet, they were meant for you and me. And that crown of thorns, that's supposed to go on you and me. That, 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 that spear that pierced his side, it should have cut into you and me. But he took our place. So we would not have to experience that. And he knew it. He even did that for the very people who were below him, mocking him and killing him. That's love. He took our place. He also took our penalty. By becoming sin. What's the penalty of sin? The wages of sin is? Is death. You see, so he needed both of his natures. He needed his human nature to be able to die. And to be able to connect to us. But he needed his divine nature, his God nature, to have it count for us. And to have what he did overcome the devil, defeat sin, defeat death itself. He paid the price we owed. And I know so often we set up these, in our minds, we set up these scales, don't we? Well, I've sinned this much, I better do this much, I better balance the scales in my favor. Don't go there, it's never going to work. Jesus is the one who took care of that. You know, this holy sacrifice the holy nature of Jesus Christ, and then taking on these sins. Um, that's what appeased God, and that's what was needed. Pastor Stephen, last week, called it propitiation. He was just showing off. I was just kidding. It was real proud of him. It's really a good word. But if, if you remember my Ash Wednesday message, all right, the priest would symbolically place the sins, symbolically place the sins of the people on a goat, and then send that goat out into the wilderness, and that goat was called a scapegoat. How many of you are scapegoats in your families? Come on. It's part of family dynamics, all right? We all got one. Um, but what the goat did symbolically, Jesus did literally. He literally had our sins placed on him, and as he died, our sins were forgiven, removed from us as far as the east is from the west, as it says in Psalm 103, just to say to us, they're never going to come back. You can't get to them. And then I love it when you look in Jeremiah and Hebrews, and it says, God says, I will remember your sins no more, which in that culture, that language, it meant I will never use them against you. Think about that. No matter what your sin is, God makes the promise. You trust in Jesus, he will not use it against you. That's big. And I know this doesn't make a lot of sense up here. But to Jesus, it was very real. And every rotten thing I've ever said or you've ever said, every unkind word I've ever spoken or you've spoken, every lie, every cheat, all our sins were placed on Jesus. And the weight, the weight of the sins of the billions and billions of people for all time, he bore that weight that crushing weight. And with that weight on him, he kept working to breathe until he could no more. And then he died. But he had to. And he knew it. And he did it with joy because he knew it went for you and me. The third phrase in this 23 words is we become that we might become the righteousness of God this third and final miracle is incredible because it's the greatest gift God gives us he doesn't just give us forgiveness the gift he gives us is the gift of being made right with God 
It's the gift of being made righteous. It's the gift of being holy. And Kevin, I, I won't use you as an example again of why you're holy even though your wife doesn't think you are, okay? I won't say that. But it's true. When he sees us, he sees us as being holy. He's not fooling himself. We are. Because Christ, there's a word you didn't use last week, imputed his righteousness, gave it to us. And when we're before God in judgment, on that judgment day, he'll say, not guilty. It doesn't get any better than that. You know, Luther summarizes all three of these miracles we just spoke about, these phrases, in one phrase called the happy exchange. The happy exchange. <laughs> what that means is Jesus got what we deserved and we get what he deserved. That's what it means. He had no sin, so he took our place as that perfect substitute, <laughs> which we needed. He was made sin so that our penalty would be paid and we would then be declared righteous and, and not guilty. He died and then rose from that grave that we might, when we die, begin a new life with the Lord forever. That's what this is all about. It's simple yet profound. And the reality is there is no salvation apart from what this one verse, these 23 words in the Bible say. It's not like God has a plan B for those who don't like plan A. There's just one plan. You come to God by way of the cross or you don't come at all. And it's that simple. And it's that profound. And I hope and pray that this moves us, not only in our own lives, to take another look at the cross, but to move us into the lives of others and reveal what the cross means for them as well. I pray that each and every day, Every one of us, including me, when we look at that cross, wherever it is, whether it's, it's up here on the wall or, 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 or whether it's, a, it's above my head or whether it's the cross out front or it's the cross around your neck or, or on your ring or wherever that cross in your home might be, that you and I would look at that cross and see it again for the very first time because we see it through the perspective of Jesus Christ. That's his love for you and me. In Jesus' name, amen.